No, it's making me nervous. Come on, starting me. Here we go. Hello. Yeah, we're live. We're live. What's up? Welcome everyone to our very first lately interview with one of the most amazing, famous <laughs> marketing experts that was like amazing enough to agree to do this with us. Um, Anne Hanley. Uh, hi. 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 Yes. I'm always so embarrassed during the introduction. I don't know what to do with my you face. Are? Yeah, uh, <laughs> that that works. No, it Distract. doesn't. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it's only embarrassing because you can see yourself. So then you're like, yeah, you know, it's true. The model. It's true. I should have been backstage, um, you know, and then I could have just and like, with an like, entrance. <laughs> oh, why? Thank you, and Hanley. Everybody. Lovely to be here. So let me, let me tell them who you are for the folks who don't know, um, and embarrass you maybe a little more. But um, <laughs> Anne is a writer, and she's a digital marketing pioneer and an all-around best-selling author and marketing expert. You may have heard of her company, Marketing Profs. It's a marketing training and education company with more than 600,000 600, subscribers, which is envious for me, for sure. That's amazing. Um, she's got a couple of hot books out there, too. They include Everybody Wins, Your Go-To Guide to Creating Ridiculously Good Content, everybody and writes. Content Rules. Everybody writes. Okay. Oh, Everybody Writes. Sorry. <laughs> everybody Writes. Nobody wins. <laughs> nobody wins. Zero percent of the people win, everybody but everybody writes, writes constantly. Gosh, everybody writes. Okay. Yeah. And um, this is human. It's a human thing. Oh, Content no, rules, how to create killer blogs, podcasts, videos, ebooks, webinars, and more that engage customers and ignite your business. So all the things that we all want to do all the time. Um, so please welcome Anne. Thank, Thank you. you Anne. Thank you. Thank you everybody for being here today. Yeah, it's a good crew. We're really excited yeah. about it. We got a lot of people asking questions on the on the way in, like, oh my gosh, you got Anne Hanley? How do you know her? And all that and I was like I don't <laughs> I actually did one time yeah exactly and you didn't know who I was remember <laughs> I know this is this is kind of like a blind date a little bit yeah yeah it was nice it was sweet and ever since then we've been best of friends we've been friends and so I I really respect you and um and I'm so very honored that you're here so oh, let's get to the you. meat meat of the thing here talk about writing Okay. You obviously do it remarkably well. I really enjoy reading your writing um, because it's the kind of writing I aspire to, as many of us do here, I know. And one of the things you do so well, Anne, is you really put your personality and your and your voice into that writing. And I was wondering if you could talk about kind of how you, how you do that, mm. what the process is for you. Sure. So um, I guess just to back up a little bit, um, you know, I get questions a lot from people who say, like, you know, they're a, a content marketer for a brand of any brand, really. Um, and they say to me, you know, well, you know, how can we write anything that's different from anybody else out there in the industry, a competitor? Like, how do we create content that's a different that's differentiated um, that sounds like us? and couldn't be coming from a competitor. Like I get that question a lot. And you know, the truth is, you know, you can't, you can't really create content about your industry that's wholly unique unless you actually use your, your voice and your perspective and give a sense of who you are. So I think uh, for brands, especially, and, and by brand, I mean, whether that's, you know, an individual or whether it's a company, I think the key is to, focus on, you know, on what you say, but more importantly, how you say it. And so, you know, I look at everything that I do and I counsel brands to do this too. You know, if you were to cover up your byline on an individual piece, or if you were to cover up your logo on like a brand blog, for example, or on a brand piece of content or on your social channel or anything, you know, do you sound different or do you sound like anybody else? Um, and so that's kind of the question that I obsess over. Um, I talked to a marketer, uh, actually, she's a partner at a consulting firm called M&R. They consult mm -hmm. with nonprofits and help them, you know, sort of do more online. And she gave me this great quote once that I talk about all the time and I think about all the time, which is, if you cover up your logo, do you recognize you? So, oh, yeah. you know, in other words, if you were to mask any visual identifiers, you know, do you sound different? And a lot of brands spend a lot of time and a lot of energy and effort thinking about the visual components of a brand and not so much on their voice. And so that's a long answer to say that I really think about voice a lot. So my process is um, and I think brands should think about voice, too. Sure. 
Um, and so my process is really that, you know, it's, there's no magic to it, really. I just, I'll, I'll create a first draft of something. I'll just sort of, as I call it, I'll just barf it up, <laughs> you know, just yeah. get it all out there, say what I want to say. And it's really the final editing process where I start to um, bring in some of my voice, you know, does every sentence sound like I wrote it? And I literally get right down to word choice, <laughs> you know, can I use a word that's more um, and than any other, than, than another word? So I look at things like uh, like adjectives and nouns and verbs. I try to create a sense of movement and momentum in my writing. That's my style, like that. yeah. yeah. That's my style, but I think you know. Once you sort of are, 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 once you sort of write with more regularity, you can get a feel for your style, and that's how you define your voice. You know, whatever just feels most authentically you. Um, so when you yeah. when you were describing this, you said sounds like a few times, and so I was wondering because I've noticed that you there is a sound to your voice yeah. when you write. Like if I read it out loud, it sounds like I'm talking to you. Is that yeah. something you do? Do you ever read it out loud or talk yeah. into writing? Yeah, that's actually really, yeah, that's really, um, that's good that you picked up on that. No one's ever asked me that. Good for you, Because I was in radio, you know. Oh, really? Oh, that's funny. Um, yeah, I actually do. One of my final, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of a, a, I'm a, I'm a relentless editor. I edit everything that I produce, and I don't mean every, like, I don't edit every single tweet I write, you know, three or four times, but every blog post or any piece of content, um, I usually, I edit it at least three times, sometimes four. Um, but the final step for me is always to read it out loud and to feel if I get tripped up along the way or if it literally sounds like me, because I think that's where you can pick up a lot of those moments where it doesn't quite sound like my voice. The other mm -hmm. reason why I do that is that I heard um, I heard somebody read something that I wrote once back to me, like it was an interview like this. And they said, oh, I really like what you said here. And they literally read what what I had written. And like in my, like my face was like this and inside it was like, Oh God, I was like, that sounds so terrible. It was like very clunky. And I was just like, it didn't flow the way that I thought it did. And, and so now that's become part of my process. I read it out loud. And I think that's a great way for anybody to listen for, for voice when you, when you do that. Sure. Cause I think there's also a real rhythm to what you write. Yes, like that's what yeah. I really noticed. And you can, you can see it. It's a visual um, kind of thing that you do also just in the shortness of the sentences or um, the overall, I don't know. I noticed that with the way that the words look um, yeah. and some of the vernacular you use. Um, actually, let's talk about that a little bit. Like, so when you're saying talk like yourself or be like something you sound like specifically, do you have, um, like a list of words that you are you're going to go to kinds of things like i'll give you an example for me i've been training some of my um, interns to write like me to help us do, do social <laughs> yeah so i made them schools and like so i'm a big fan of contractions um i do say so and 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 i use ellipses and dashes and these are just some of the writing techniques that i use that i'm trying to get them to incorporate as well are there are those mm. that you do um First of all, I love that you do that. I mean, what you're essentially doing is creating like a Kate style guide, which I really love. I'm a big fan of, of doing that if you have a team of people creating content for you or if you work with freelance writers, for example. Um, and by, you know, style guide sounds so like, like terrible and heavy and like something that you never, like an entire set of encyclopedias, you know, from the library in the 1980s or something. So not like that. <laughs> Um, but you know, just like like something that you just said there is just something really quick and breezy and easy that you can sort of pass out and add to. I'm a big fan of like at Marketing Pros, we have one just on a Google Doc, you know, you know, of like yeah. words that we use. We it's not e-mail, it's email with no hyphen, you know, things like that. Um so so yeah, so I don't necessarily have that because I don't hire anybody to create content for me. I don't hire writers, I don't work with them. So it really just comes from me. But I do keep a, a notebook and a running list of words that I sort of love all the time. <laughs> and so, uh, I don't know, I like words that have a sort of quirkiness to them because that's kind of part of my brand. Um, and so whenever I see a word like that, um, like, you know, it's a little bit like, yeah, it's a little bit like like after you buy a new car and then you notice on the road that like every everybody else has that Audi that you just bought, you know what I mean? It's like, it's kind of like that, like once I, I, for some reason, I just see those words and it's like, oh, that's like an and word, you know? So, um, and then I'll write it in my notebook. So like, I'm a big example. Do you mind? Uh, nincompoop is a good yeah. one. Like, 
<laughs> like that's a word you don't really hear, but isn't that a, that's, that's like it's such a great, great word. word. It's very like, it's hilarious. Like I like words that are sort um, of like quirky and weird like that. They're hilarious. Yeah. Like people don't really say them. Like you and I probably wouldn't really use that word in conversation with each other. But like when you read it, it's just, I don't know. I like words that are sort of funny like that, you know? It says so much. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, I just finished David Sedaris's new book, uh, Calypso. It's um, a new book of essays that he just published. And he's a master at word choice. He, is, um, yeah. he finds, I don't, are you a fan of Sedaris? Yeah, for sure. And especially for the radio purpose, because he does so much of those books like over the air. So yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. A lot of his stories, like I think he originally was discovered by Ira Glass, right, of yeah. This American Life. Um, and so uh, his, I, I don't, um, I don't think I write like him per se, but we have some similarities in the way that we choose words that are, you know, somewhat quirky and weird and, and uh, like you read them and you just think that is a funny word, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't know. They can inspire to... other words too. Yeah. I think, right. Yeah. yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, exactly. Or you like using words in weird contexts. And like, and now having said that, I can't even think of a single one, but, um, but like but... making a word your own, you mean? Like, um, using words that you are used to seeing in one context in another context. So, uh, for example, I use the word, um, I use the word neutered to describe somebody who was feeling powerless at work. And now you don't usually hear the word neuter right. outside of say <laughs> animal husbandry or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I actually, I used it on Twitter. This is actually a couple of years ago. I used this and like people took me to task for that immediately. It was just like, cause I was talking okay. about how some marketers can feel neutered by their bosses or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, it's, so it's an odd use of the word neuter to describe a feeling that a lot of marketers have, right. Of feeling that they can't really make a decision on their own, that they have to rely on their boss or CEO or you know, you know whatever. What that does too is it really, <laughs> um, it, that reinforces your authority as a writer. Um, yeah. And you can combine the language like that. I mean, I remember taking a fiction writing, lots of fiction writing classes in college. And one professor, you know, I said, oh, we can't start a sentence with and. And they were like, you can start a sentence with anything you want. <laughs> and I was like, oh, really? And you can, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, a lot of people, when when they tell me that they're terrible writers or that they're awkward writers, what they really mean, I find, is that they are uncomfortable with grammar. And so I think it's good to know grammar, but you know, we live in a world where you can get a lot of, there's a lot of tools that can help you with grammar. Like, you know, one of my favorite tools is, um, is Grammarly. Almost everything that I write, I run through Grammarly or Hemingway app, one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and so that'll be sort of a good first pass as an editor. Like I also use an actual live human editor for everything that I do, um, everything, everything that I publish anyway. But, you know, there's lots of ways that, I mean, even word will help you with grammar, you know, so I don't worry as much about grammar. I think it's important to know the rules of grammar, basically, so that you can break them, <laughs> you know, and that's, yeah. that's, again, where your voice can come true, come through too. Um, when I was a less confident writer, I used to always make sure that I wrote in complete sentences, that everything had to have a noun and a verb and had to be, you know, not a fragment, but now I freely will use a fragment. And like Word and Grammarly and Hemingway app and all those programs will get really pissed off at me. You know, <laughs> you know? they're just like, you can't do that. Hey. And like, I'll have all these red marks all over the, uh, all over the screen. But I'm like, you know, press OK. OK, OK. Allow, allow, allow. Yeah, because, sure. you know, that's my voice and that's who I am. But that only comes with with confidence. You know, if you do it out of ignorance, that's not a great it's way not. to write. But if I think if it comes from a place of confidence, that's um that's much, much, much stronger, you know, and that's, that's really where your voice comes in. And do you find that um, you, is this a persona that you are c cultivating, like through the writing? Like, is it a hundred percent Anne or like, is the voice and the marketer, do you know what I mean? Like, it's a hundred percent Anne. It yeah, is. it is. That's hard to do. Yeah. Is it? So, I don't know. I don't. Well, not for me, actually, but I think for a lot of people it is um, because it's a, it's being naked in a sense, right? Like, mm -hmm. so you're really just like letting yourself, you're letting yourself out there. You're giving mm -hmm. people enough sense of your humanity, right? So that we, f we feel like we have access to you or that we know you. Um, and your comfortability with yourself gives other people permission to, to then reply in kind, I, I find. 
Mm. Um, and I'm sure you do as well. And there's a real, um, that's, that's a power that you wield in, right? Like, yeah. so that's, that's why you're so, um, so many people look up to you in this way is because, because you're able to be so comfortable with yourself, you're like leading, you're leading him in that same direction, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I'm like slightly uncomfortable again, but <laughs> um, here's the thing that I've learned. And, uh, you know, like when you like, it's a hundred percent me for sure, but it, it wasn't always that. And I think that comes with, with confidence. I find that the more real that I get, you know, like the more and that I am, so to speak. I don't know why I'm using my word as an adjective. I mean, my name is an adjective. That's like so strange. But, you know, the more the more that I allow my you know self to be the quirky person that I am, I find the more that it resonates with people. But you're right in the sense that there's a vulnerability to it, like you are naked. And so that means that some people like don't like the way you look when you're naked, you know. And now we're getting into some weird territory, but um, <laughs> it's, you know what I mean though? It's like, yeah, some people are like, I'm not comfortable with that. And my God, I didn't know you had a mole there. You know, it's like that. <laughs> so, um, I mean, but there's a whole, of, yeah, no, there's sorry, a say, part of the human, the human, human thing, right? So we, we, yeah. um, Brian Kramer is a mutual friend of ours. If yes. anybody on the call doesn't know Brian Kramer, Google him, Brian with a Y. And he started the H two H human human movement. So yeah. this idea that there's no more B two B or B two C. Yeah. That it's all about being yourself and being authentic and being um, naked, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> right, too. right. Um, but yeah, I think like if someone when when you were learning how to be more yourself or when you were gaining your confidence, um, we talked about when you when you read yourself out loud or when you heard someone read you out loud. But were there other things that happened along the way that made a um, twist for you or to, to trigger new confidence or new styles that you started using? Yeah. Um, it's when I realized that the best writing while it sh it's personal to me, like when I just said to you that, you know, I find the more, the more personal, the more, I guess the more that I reveal my own personality and my own take on things that the more it resonates, that's true to a point. But the other piece of that is that, you know, it's like you you want to you want to create content that's um, that's relevant to you personally, that resonates with you personally, but also has a, a broader universal appeal. And so that was the other piece. Like when I go back and read some of my early blog posts, or when I go back and read even some of like my early like my early essays, like for example, it was very much turned inwardly. Like it was very much about me. And it's really been a, a sort of evolution for me to realize that it's my, that the best kind of writing is both personal as well as universal. So whatever you are writing, nonetheless, can be about you, but it should also have some relevance for your audience or a lot of relevance for your audience. Like they should be able to, to glimpse themselves in that. Mm -hmm. And so that's a tricky balance, you know, but that's been a that's been a, a thing that I've really honed and really developed over time, because I don't want somebody to read it and say, well, that's an awesome story, but you know, it's all about her. Like to me, that's not why I write. I write to connect with other people. I've always been like that. I've always like, I've never had any interest in keeping a diary. You know, that to me was like the highest form of boring. You know, it's like, I already know what I feel about something. Why do I have to write it down? Like it just felt like such a chore, but yet sure. the notion of, you know, writing to connect with other people to, you know, sort of bring a little, connectivity into my life to make our each of us a little less lonely like that's really what I'm all about and so that's whether it's on a personal level or whether you know I want every marketer to feel like they're not the only one who has this problem or every business owner to feel like they're not the only one who's right. struggling in this particular way and so I think as long as you can give you know write with some humility at the same time that you're writing with confidence so that it's the balance of, of humility it's about you but it's not <laughs> about you ultimately mm -hmm and confidence of feeling like, you know, yes, I have something important to say and here's why it should matter to you. Um, so that's how I that's how I think about writing. And that's been a, a way that I've sort of evolved, I think, um, as a writer. And I think I think a lot of the best writers do that. So um, because you're putting yourself out there, right, as, mm -hmm. as is part of the job, like what's been um, have there has there been any times where like this authentic person who, who is you know with your however you're communicating yourself and things you're learning like how when the feedback has been like tough or challenging mm. as a result of like your your openness 
Like what's, what's that been like? Um, like how do I deal with it? You mean? Yeah. I just wondering. Yeah. Like <laughs> did some, did anybody ever say like, did you do something and you revealed something and then somebody like bid on it the wrong way or did, has that ever happened to you? Cause I feel like some people hmm. are scared about writing their writing to themselves or write, writing, writing with their persona out there and putting themselves out there because they don't want to be maybe judged or, I mean, like I, I put out a video recently and someone called me unkempt and like, I mean, I am unkempt. <laughs> I jam, whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know, like sometimes it's hard, to, harder to deal with that, but you kind of, you don't ask for it, but it's more, it happens the more, um, accessible you are, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely true. I mean, you know, you're always going to have that element of, of society, I guess, who just will flat out criticize you. Like we love to judge each other, don't we? I mean, <laughs> in, in reality, we just do. And, uh, and sometimes it's from strangers who judge us in a very mean way. Um, I mean, that stuff bothers me, you know, but just like I think it bothers anybody else, you know, but at the same time, you just have to, I don't know, I try not to read my one star reviews on Amazon, you know, it's like, <laughs> that's the bottom line. It's like, I can have 97 people who love this, this book, and I can have one person who says that they, that, you know, I'm the writer's version of Unkempt, like, I'm just like, you know, whatever, what do I have to say that's all that interesting? And that's the one that I listen to. I think that's human nature that we just sort of gravitate toward that. Like, I'm sure uh, you had uh, many other comments on there who's like, this is the best video ever. And you're like, yeah, yeah, you're lying to me. That one, though, like, <laughs> that one is telling the truth. It's true. Um, it's like having a, a zit, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think you have to, um, well, here's the thing. Sometimes I think there's value in hearing the criticism because sometimes it can tell you something useful. Um, and sometimes I think there's no value in hearing the criticism because it's just, there's just no value to it. And so to me, I think about where the criticism is coming from. Um, and I, I heard, a, um, I actually, it was a video, I think, that I saw from Brene Brown, um, you know, Brene Brown. Uh, not too long ago, and actually it was a, a, I think it was just on YouTube, and she talks about the kinds of criticism, critics she listens to, and she has this analogy um, about going into the arena for, you know, like, like in Roman times, like you're preparing for a fight, and you'll go into the arena, and instead of like, you know, looking at the critics just as all being one and the same, look at the ones who are also in the arena with you. So look at the people who are also out there getting their ass kicked is, is how, to, how she phrases it. And I think of that a lot. Um, and so I think one way that I insulate myself against, you know, people who are just flat out haters, and believe me, there aren't a lot of them. I mean, you know, I try really hard to be, you know, authentic, but I also try really hard to be very sincere with everybody. And when I feel that somebody gives me like some negative feedback, I try to understand where they're coming from. Um, but that said, you know, some people are just jerks. And so one way that I insulate what myself um, with that is just to have this sort of trusted circle of, of people around me who, you know, I know will give me real honest feedback. There's a few people in my life that when I'm not sure about something, um, you know, professional contacts I'll, and personal contacts, I'll just sort of like, you know, shoot them something and say, what do you think about this? And that's true, whether it's a video or um, you know, a piece of writing or, what, or whatever it may be that I'm creating, my new newsletter, for example, um, anything like that, you know, where I'll tend to sh share it with them first as a, as a sort of gut check, you know, is this okay or is this like, you know, not okay. Um, and I think just developing that sensibility both internally and then developing that sort of safety around you, this sort of circle of people who you can go to when you need that kind of feedback is, um, is really useful. Cool. So let's talk about that newsletter real quick. And then um, yeah. we're almost out of time, but I wanted what? to also, I know, right. <laughs> I wanted to um, like part with what your favorite writing tips. So, Oh, um, okay, cool. So t think about that for a second. So the newsletter is annhanley.com slash newsletter. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so in this week's newsletter, I just, I just wrote about this. So um, it's six months old and you know, it's kind of a funny thing that I would be starting a newsletter now. I mean, I have marketing props. We have an entire, you know, newsletter program over there. You can get as many newsletters as you want all the time. Newsletters for everyone. Um, but, you know, I found that when I started marketing props in 2002, oh my God. Um, so yeah, so a long time ago, 
I was the one who was doing everything. You know, I was writing all the newsletter blurbs. I was editing all the articles that went on the site that went in the newsletter. I, you know, pushed the button that deployed the newsletter out to our subscribers. And yet with success comes distance, you know, so you stop yeah. doing stuff like that after a while because you hire people to do it for you. But the downside of that is that I didn't feel like I was making anything anymore. I mean, certainly, you know, I write books and I write speeches and I, I create there, but I wasn't building my own, you know, sort of thing. I wasn't pushing the button anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to do that. And so just as a sort of experiment, I thought, all right, well, let's just start this newsletter. So I talk about um, marketing and content and writing, the, that sort of sweet spot of those three things. Um, and it's, it's quirky and I love it. So you should sign up just because. Mm -hmm. I did. I think I think I did. I'm going to have to now. Um, and, and you guys should sign up as well because, of course, there's lots more writing tips from Anne, um, you know, coming through her newsletters and her books, which we talked about before. Yeah. Also. Um, and let's talk about some of those. Let's leave some folks some tips. We got about four minutes here, so we got some good time to talk about some some of your favorite writing tips. Mm, okay. You want me just to go? Yeah. Favorite writing tips. Go. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think we talked about, you know, my, my, really my best tip, which is to really hone your voice um, and try to, uh, try to really lean into that, you know, voice isn't something that you're just going to find, it's something that you will develop over time. And so really, that comes from developing a writing habit. So my, I guess my first tip is really just to write often, you know, I, I write every single day, I don't publish every single day, but I write for 15 minutes, at least ish, you know, every single day. I mean, I don't set, set a timer like some people do. Um, but I think it's important just to create a, a writing habit. So that's, um, that's the a sort of maybe a boring tip, but I think it's the single biggest thing that'll improve your writing is just to write. Sure. Um, Second thing is, uh, never go straight from writing to publishing. <laughs> because <laughs> That's just, that's a hard no. You know, I always think of writing as like um, like an unripe avocado. You know, it needs to sort of hang out on the kitchen counter for a couple of days to get to a point where it's really appealing. Totally. Yeah. And I think that's true of writing too. It's like, I always put some distance between the writing and then the editing. And the reason why I do that is because um, like Stephen King said, uh, write with the door closed, edit with the door open. So write right. with the, like, just write for yourself, do whatever you have to do, and then think about your audience when you open the door and, and you know, and use the editing there. Um, and when you're editing, um, or yeah. just, I want to know about that process a little bit. Are you like a move stuff around kind of person? Or are you like trying to delete as much as possible? Like what are... Um, it depends on how well something has flowed, but, um, but from for yeah, usually I call edit, editing by chainsaw. That's usually how I start, which is to sort of like take the big chunks and literally like with a chainsaw, like cut and edit and move them around. Yeah. Um, and then I edit that my second edit is editing with surgical tools. <laughs> so that's when I'm thinking about things like word choice and really getting more finely into it. Awesome. Um, but it depends. Like sometimes, you know, it's like the same is true for me. Like it's probably you for you. Like so sometimes things come really easily and they just flow and you're like, you get to the end of it. You're like, yes, that's not yeah. going to take a lot of polishing. And other times it's like, you know, it's like wading through cement, you know, it just feels <laughs> like, oh, it takes forever. It's a good feeling. Um, yeah. Um, so, so with that, we have to wrap because we're just about done. Um, and well, that was fast, huh? I know you're um, you're really wonderful, and I really uh, really can't thank <laughs> no, you enough for doing oh, this. Oh, thank you! I'm so honored to be asked. Thanks. It's I'm awesome. Glad we, I'm glad we figured this out. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah. So um, for folks um, on the who are watching us, hi! Thank you so much. By the way, I just want to let you know that Brian Fanzo is going to be our next guest on August 15th. So Ooh. that's about a month from now. Yay! Yay. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And um, if you want more information, you can always find us at trylately.com. And Anne's newsletter again is annhanley.com slash newsletter. So thank you, Anne. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Okay. Rock on. Bye.